Hi. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm GR. <laughs> Welcome to Player Base. And last time, I said that we would talk more about the Tiefling, and we will, but that's in the next video. Today, we are going to focus on a last reliance on dragon men, elves, and dwarves, because I want to talk about all of them together, get this down, and then move forward. The issue uh, with the dragon mans is, and interestingly enough, you know, if you're one of the 75% of people who are millennials and zoomers who are playing the game, like, dr dragon people were a standard race from fourth edition onward. It's relatively new. And the reason it's considered just part of the whole canon now is because it's so popular, because people want to play as dragon mans. And the people who want to play as dragon mans want to breathe the fucking fire out of their mouths. And if you don't let them do that in a way that makes them feel powerful and engaged, then you're not re... <clears throat> You know, you're, again, selling them the cookies. They come in the nice box, but they taste like the cheap ones. You know? Give them the breath weapon. Make it be too powerful. Like, if they're burning up too many people, like, make them fight some mermaids or, you know, some fire golems or something. Like, it doesn't... There's loads of ways around this. The purpose of giving them powers is not only make them feel powerful... But that, making them feel powerful, is itself subservient to allowing them or giving them the tools to engage emotionally, intellectually, and psychologically with the persona in the narrative. And they know that a person who's like a dragon man can just go, Wah! you know, like Smaug or Gojira or whatever. And if they're not doing that in the game, because the rules are there to give them a sense of reliable phenomenology that allow them to engage in the game and their suspension of disbelief, then they're thrown right out of it. And it's disappointing and unsatisfying. Like, no one is being cheated if the Dragon Man burns up too many of the minions that you send at them. And again, like I was saying last video, if you have the problem that you have one character who's mechanically in terms of martial attack, way stronger than the other ones, you just throw more enemies at them in particular. It's as simple as that. And if, you know, they feel like you're picking on them, you can just tell them, like, in-game, in they can obviously see that you're the strongest character, so they know to gang up on you because it's going to take more of them. It's real obvious, you know? If you were some, like, street boss and you had a bunch of, like, cutthroat gang members, say so you had six of them, and you approach a party of like, you know, two teenage girls, like a dude with a book and a guy who's 6'8 with red skin, who are you gonna tell to jump on, right? Like the teenagers or like the dude who was literally the size of a refrigerator and a different color? And you know, an interesting bit of insight. I suspect that the reason they're giving all these different like animal and creature and foreign racial options in relation to their wanting to make people feel more included is because, and this is, I'm, this is just an inference, this isn't based on fact, I could be totally wrong about this, but I would bet that, you know, black people playing the game and um, like Asians, uh, Mesoamericans, Native Americans, people who are not Caucasian, veer towards characters which are not humanoid and western humanoid, which is to say elves, dwarves, and, and humans in the game because it gives them a bit more uh, breathing room to put themselves in the character. That's not because like there's a load of African Americans who really want to be dragon people. There might be, but it's probably because you don't really have any convincing options for them. You know, I mean, in video games, this is a real issue because like just to a a YouTube search for like dudes looking for you know black or African hairstyles in the character customization of any video game and like mechanically <laughs> just as, as a side point you know uh, pop culture is driven by African American pop culture right Dragon Ball was popular in the States for a long time before it became universally popular, and it didn't become universally popular until black people started liking it. Like, black teenagers and nerds 
like Dragon Ball, and now it's all over the place. The same thing is true with loads of things. I mean, to say nothing of the fact that most of American pop culture is the product of African American youth culture, like jazz and rock and roll and rap music and dancing and the way that we talk. Like all of that stuff, the, the American, the United States, like cultural hegemony over the entire world really is the response, to say nothing of sports, right, um, of people adopting and following suit with African-American popular artistic and youth culture. And so if you want to get those people on board, you got to give them something that they want and, and stuff that they need in order to get in. And giving them more animal people is not it. You know, it's like if I go to, it's, it's like the vegan conundrum, right? If, you, if you're a vegan and you go to like a barbecue restaurant and, you know, the only thing on the menu you can eat is like one of the three types of like side bread they have and the salad, if you're the, if you're the, the head chef of that restaurant or the general manager, you go, okay, well, we have vegans coming in and they're ordering these breads and these salads. So the answer is to put in way more breads and salads if we want to get their, their business when they come in with groups of their meat eating friends. My friend, that is not the case. It's just that's all they have to eat. There's loads of stuff you can do for that. Uh, that's a whole other, there's more to that topic. Um, and I want to talk about that later, but I want to focus on the Dragon Man's issue in terms of not giving them the strong breath weapon, it, they need to feel powerful because they know that a Dragon Man would be powerful. It's more important to give them that power so that they can be engaged in the game. It's not about giving them a, a slice of cake as big as their brothers. That's not the issue. That was, to a certain extent, the issue back when TSR ran it, and third edition was a big response and a concordance to all of those, you know, ecumenical papal wars, basically, um, of the 80s and the 70s and the 90s. But all of that stuff now, even the responses to it, are largely vestigial. It's not an issue. The issue is that there's no entryway. And that is, like, the, the paradigm with which we think about the structure of the game and w within which Watsi is thinking about it is the principal source of all of their problems. And, and you can see that when you look at what they're asking you and also what they're presenting to you. So the elves, I mean, I can't, there's negligible differences here. And the reason for that is because elves are pretty well suited. You know, they're, they're attested for. The, within the realm of the limitations of the mechanics that they're using, you can be an elf as good as you can be an elf. Now with, with dwarves, actually dwarves are over there, the issue is, uh, oh no, sorry, they're there, uh, that, you know, maybe there isn't the same type of a differentiation as there are with elves, right? You know, people have a very distinct sense of when you say elf, either you mean some type of, you know, merry, capricious, but dangerous forest-dwelling spirit who can fly between the tre treetops and fly arrows, uh, faster you can say, hey, who is that? And then there's the type of elf who wants to stab Satan in the foot seven times. Right? Those are two very different narrative styles for uh, the Eldar. And both of them are well attested for in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, at, and hey, you know, <laughs> um, like maybe you want to be you know, a kind of a Sam Spade type character uh, who walks on their own and is like good but misunderstood or bad but misunderstood. And then you have the drow. I mean, the, the origin of the drow is something that, they have that too. People like it. Uh, I don't exactly understand why. I haven't, full disclosure, I haven't played with a lot of drow players. But whatever the drow need, the drow more or less have it, as far as I can tell. With dwarves, you know, they only have one dwarven option now, and they said, because we want to make the dwarfiest dwarf, and maybe there's really only one type of dwarf. But I would caution against taking those options away, not because, 
they need to have the strongest possible choices because that, as near as I can tell, is what they've done. You know, they saw that the hill dwarf wasn't as mechanically powerful or as desirable as the mountain dwarf. And so they took what was good with that and they put it with the mountain dwarf. And that still thinks on that paradigm. And if there's no other type of fantasy dwarf than the particular type of Gimli or Thorin that they have, fine. That may be the case. But don't cut the options down because you're thinking of some type of, again, competitive Red Queen scenario where they have to have the most and best and latest gear, right? They, they go in this with stone cunning, right? You know, they've nerfed stone cunning and they've done it in a very passive aggressive way because now you have to file paperwork. And that's the, like, I mean, if you, here's the thing, if, you're, if you've not run a game of D&D, the hard part is not remembering how the rules work or which goblin got 16 hit points and which one got 10 hit points. The hard part is reminding the same player for the third time that game, and by no means the third time in the history of you playing together, how many hit points they have. Not how many they lost, but just how many they have and where it is on the character sheet. Now there's a whole bunch of little like festivist resentments that we could go into on that, but the important point is any amount of making the player character look at their sheet, especially to remember to do something that is basically this is what you do as a dwarf, is punitive not just to them but to the whole table. You know, it's like getting a flat tire with the the eighteen wheeler in the middle of the convoy. Everyone's got to stop. And also, like, is stone calling so powerful that people are cheesing through entire games with it? It's like, first of all, if they are doing something that is within the that they understand so intuitively that's um, in, within their character set and was in is within the narrative flow of that character archetype that they are able to cheese any like uh, obstacles or mechanics you have, two things are going on. One, they're doing their job because they are playing the character. And two, put them in some fucking wooden rooms, for God's sake. Like, if the problem is they are able to circumvent any obstacles or dangers you have in all of the dungeons that you're running, have them walk through some houses. I mean, it's not that complicated. If the you are... The gods in your world are as minuscule a plaything as the minions in the first party, the, the party encounters. That's negligible. You, you're not the gods of the universe as the dungeon master or as the game designer. You're the laws of those gods of the universe. It, if you can't work this out, if this is a problem for you as a designer or as, a, or as someone running a game, the problem is not within the material provided. The problem is within your paradigm. Like, even within the most meticulous rules as written, persnickety rules lawyering context, any competent or, which is to say, like agile game runner, dungeon master, can kill a party in about three rounds with whatever they have available. You know, like, you can kill someone with a set of chopsticks. That's actually true. Like, it's really, it just comes down to, that they're not presenting the material, they're not thinking about the material, and they're not presenting it to the people in charge of thinking about running the game, not only the dungeon masters, but also the, the PCs themselves, in a way that informs them what they can do. And I'm gonna talk about that later on in the series, but. One of the things that they're really doing with 1D&D, which is really, really admirable and um, the highest good, is because there aren't, in terms of rules, many differences, actually, with 5th edition and with 1D&D versus 5th edition and 4th edition or 5th edition and 3rd edition or 3rd edition and 2nd edition. Like, the closest it comes is 2nd edition and 1st edition because 2nd edition is really just a collating of the random notes into some kind of concordance from first edition and OD and D and white box and chainmail and all that into something that kind of is slightly more coherent. And 
breaking up the tools into their component parts, like it shows you how to make a, a half orc, for instance. Most players and dungeon masters who have a real sense of how the burrito is made have been doing that since, you know, they made a stone wheel to slice a piece of bread. It's not super complicated. But spelling it out explicitly for a population of uh, Zoomers and Millennials is key because those kids and grown-ups don't know that you can do that. Most of the role-playing games that most of the people playing D&D have played, they don't know that they're role-playing games because the DNA of Dungeons & Dragons and tabletop role-playing games is so widely disseminated within the architecture of how computers work to begin with, to say nothing of how we interface with user experiences, to say nothing of video games explicitly, that you would have to explain to them for them to be able to recognize that, oh, that's a, that's a role-playing mechanic that comes directly out of D&D. Like, most people are surprised, when you tell them, they're surprised to find out that Final Fantasy, like, you know, they had to change some of the names of the, of the enemies in Final Fantasy because it was right out of the first edition, like, monster manuals. They, you know, it's just, the rules are just first edition D&D. It's just a campaign. The record of the Lotus War as well, as long as we're talking about, like, anime and Asian Japanese products. But, I mean, that's true of most Call of Duty games are role-playing games now. You know, they have all kinds of achievements and developments, all kinds, you know, these game loops of, you know, MacGuffins that you, that you build up to get better MacGuffins, all that stuff comes from D&D. So, if you're getting people who are coming from th literally thousands of video games per person in terms of their a priori expectations, you have to say to them explicitly, you can do whatever. And that runs into some complications with virtual tabletops, but we'll get into that in a different video. Um, and I mean that for the success of Dungeons and Dragons and Watsi, not just for everybody. But with this, you have to be able to present to them the material in a way that explicitly teaches them how to manipulate it. And with stone sense and stone cunning, you're going against that because you're nerfing it instead of teaching the dungeon masters and the players how to work around it. Like, you know, the Red Queen scenario, which is, so the Red Queen scenario comes from the Red Queen section of Alice in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass. I'm pretty sure it's Alice in Wonderland. Through the Looking Glass is a sequel. But it's, um, you know, it's referred to in evolutionary biology and in game theory as the scenario where people are constantly evolving their techniques or their adaptability as a creature so they can even just stay in the same position in terms of the, the dynamic. And the problem with uh, Arneson's in, uh, like input with you know, leveling up, Arneson did that so as to give people motivation to play more. You know, it's a, it's a Pandora's gift, but um, the problem with it is that you run into one of two issues. Either no matter what they do, they're in the same position in the hierarchy, so no matter how much stronger the numbers get on their weapon or their abilities, it still takes three hits to kill something. This happens a lot, like, interestingly enough, this happens a lot, like, in Minecraft. And I mean, like, with mods that are not, like, very tightly regulated. You'll get armor or weapons that are powerful, and no matter what the numbers say, it always takes roughly the same amount of hits to kill the same enemy which is really strange. And it really throws you out of the game. So with tools like stone cutting or stone sense, you either have that where no matter how much better you get at it, you're still kind, it's still the same amount of effort to get anything done as you level up. Or two, it's so powerful, it's like God mode, and again, your engagement is completely thrown off, right? Because one of the reasons that experienced players avoid console commands and god mode cheats is because it takes all the flavor out of the thing. And, you know, the other side of that uh, with the overpowerful is that it's too hard. You know, if a game is too challenging, that no matter what you do, it's the same amount of disproportionate difficulty, that is also dispiriting. One of the secrets of... Um, 
the Souls-like games is that it's easy to understand and difficult to master. And once you get good at it, you can readily dispatch all sorts of enemies that if you take your eye off them for a second will kill you immediately. So there, it, it circumvents this issue because in Dark Souls, you get good at the thing and then you can use the skills that you have and the numerical advantages you have to dispatch enemies but still have to be on your game. You get better at playing the game, but the game is still dangerous. In 3rd edition and in 4th edition, they called this the Epic Six, where the characters would go up to 6th level normally, and then after that, they would just get feats. So their, their, their ability scores, their stats, and their hit points would not go up. They would still be just as squishy and have just the same amount of limitations. They would just get better at specialized skills. So that when they fought like a 5th level orc, that orc was as dangerous in the in the 10th session as it was in the 200th session. And that's the tweak that they're really struggling with here. Um, but I, I think that's, like, for now, that's that's enough, right? It's the issue with the, with the nerfing of the mechanics is that they don't have a handle on not only the, the, the meaning of the mechanics of, of the game, which is to say, you know, to engage the players in, in the suspension of disbelief, but also because of that, they can't quite tweak it to the point where players feel powerful but still vulnerable. And with that little gem, hey, like, comment, uh, subscribe, put the bell icon, share this with people you think would like to hear it, share with people you think would hate it. You know, either way, uh, I'm happy to hear from you. But until next time, when we will be talking about tieflings, uh, I'm GR, and uh, this has been Player Base. Uh, thank you for listening to these rambles about ludology. Ciao, ciao.